Hi, my name is Soraya Buhanda, and I'm a professional learning specialist with Code.org. I want to thank all of the classrooms tuning in for today's My Journeys class chat. Teachers, please know we have enabled live closed captioning for all of our class chats. I'd like to welcome Danny Bazo, a creative engineer at Meow Wolf, where he helps to build super cool interactive art. I'm excited to talk with Danny because I've been to Meow Wolf, both as a parent with my family and as a teacher with my students on a field trip. Danny is going to share with us his journey from robotics to electronic music to game design that eventually led him to where he is now. Teachers, please know, let us know where your class is from and add your students' questions for Danny in the Q&A. We'll try our best to get to some of those questions during the chat today. So Danny, let's start with a would you rather question. The question is, would you rather be forced to sing along or dance to every single song you hear? I'll go first. Um, I think I would rather have to dance to every single song I hear to kind of work it out through dance uh, instead of forced to sing the songs. What would you rather, Danny? Uh, that's a hard one. I'm a terrible dancer, but I could fake my way through with a little operatic through pretty much everything. Nice. <laughs> All right, let's dive right in. So what is Meow Wolf and where does its name come from? Ah, uh, okay. So um, I'll share some pictures with you here and we'll talk about that. Um, Meow Wolf is a group of artists who make uh, what are called immersive interactive installations. And that's a, a lot of words to mean a, a place where a story is sort of happening. And I'll start by answering your, your second question. Where, what does Meow Wolf mean? Where did it come from? Um, well, it's a group of artists and they couldn't agree on the name a long time ago. So what did they do? They threw random words into a hat and agreed that whatever first two words they picked out of the hat would be the name of the group. And that's how we became Meow Wolf a long time ago. And so what is Meow Wolf? Well, I'll show you a video about one of our stories um, from our installation in Las Vegas. And this is a story in Las Vegas about a grocery store uh, with maybe a twist. So Meow Wolf is a place where uh, a story is happening and by interacting with um, a big, almost sort of movie set, um, you take part in the story too. That is so awesome. Before we go on, Danny, I do wanna acknowledge some of the classrooms. So we have San Diego, Elk Grove, California, Thurman Middle School in Frederick, Maryland, North Dakota, fourth graders from Carson City, Nevada, um, a CSD class from Sacramento, California. And one class that did respond to the would you rather, half of the class would like to sing and half of the class would like to dance. So now Danny, what does a creative engineer do? Oh, that, well, that's a good question. So um, I'll show you some pictures about that too, uh, about what we do at Meow Wolf. So um, some of our, um, places in, in the installations have interactive things like this. For example, on the left is a huge skeleton that you could play like a xylophone. You hit it with a mallet and each rib makes a different noise and makes a different sound happen. Um, on the right is a set of mushrooms in the forest where if you sort of bop them, they make a different sound and, and uh, play some lighting animation as well. So I work on the team that is behind the scenes for those kinds of elements, doing the wiring, the code, and the electronics that makes all that interactive stuff uh, happen. That's really cool. Also, quick shout out to those uh, students in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So how did you decide to become a creative engineer? Well, um, I've always had an interest in art and in um, making things, whether it's electronics or whether it's code or mechanical stuff. Um, 
when I was young, I played with Legos basically all day, especially the Technic Legos that allowed you to use gears and mechanisms. I did that all the time. Um, but I also was kind of drawing and painting and trying to figure out a way to put all this stuff together. Um, when I was young, the creative engineering at Mel sort of didn't exist. And the next closest thing was like movie special effects. I love movie special effects. So I thought I would be a movie special effects person. Um, and in fact, uh, if you want to hear about the training that I did, I could show you some pictures that kind of led me along this, this path here. Yeah, yeah. sure. Oops. Oh, yeah, I, I left out some of the uh, other things that, that we do as creative engineers is write a lot of code. And some, some of you who code yourselves might recognize on the left the processing language uh, that we use a lot at now. So um, I got my start, oops, um, uh, going through school. So here's some robots that I worked at, at worked on um, through the various schools that I've gone to. On the left is a, is a underwater robot that I worked at, 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 shout out to San Diego, at San Diego Community College. On the right here is some Roombas that I programmed with, uh, that, that I programmed to do some ch uh, chase games with. And on the middle here is a set of robotic cameras. Let me see if I can find a picture of one that I um, worked with at university. So most of my training was done through school. I ended up going through school for uh, engineering and robotics. That's so cool. So walk us through your thought process for thinking about and creating art from devices and electronics. Well, um, to me, as an electronic artist, um, I treat circuits and code almost like my paintbrushes. When I have an idea for a creative work or at Malif, when someone else has an idea for creative work, I think of ways to make that happen using the paintbrushes and tools that I have. So um, what kind of circuits would help me um, do what people want? What kind of sensors or what kind of motors and actuators would help us get the animations we want? Um, so I started there with the creative idea and then kind of worked my way over um, into what technology would work best. Cool. So what other, I know you've mentioned already some of your CS um, skills that you've, or programs that you've done, but what other CS skills did you learn and um, what do you use today in your work? Uh, well, along the way, um, since my background is in robotics, you use a lot of um, math. So I, I've done a lot of, um, well, calculus and a lot of matrix algebra. And for coding, um, we use a few languages. One of them, as I mentioned, is called processing. Um, another one is called Max. Uh, other ones are called Touch Designer. And a lot of these are free and, in fact, easy for young folks to just pick up and start to learn. Um, processing, for example, has a huge community where you could ask questions and get feedback for how to do projects that you want to do. That's so cool. Do you have any examples you'd like to share with us of other work you've done? Sure. I've got an example of a, um, one project I did at Meow Wolf. Let's see if I can navigate up to it. This was uh, a project for our dark ride. This is a, a slow roller coaster ride in Denver where we have an animated character out front who tells the story that you're sort of about to see in the ride. So as we began programming the character, I had to come up with a creative way to program these characters' movements um, using my own body. And so what I'm going to show you is a video Here's our little robot, and there's me. And what we do is we've got a camera on me and some software that I've written translating my movements right over to the robot. And the robot can't move the same way I can with all these different joints. It only has a few different movements, but I was able using the computer science that I know to sort of translate my movements over to this robot and animate the character at the front of our new ride. And how long does a project like that take? That, that one probably took like a month or so of, uh, of dedicated work for myself and a big team. I pretty much never work alone on projects. Once you get to complicated projects, it's all teamwork. And uh, I work on teams of, you know, maybe up to a dozen or more people if the project's big and sometimes just uh, three or four people. But a project like that took many people and uh, a few months. Do you also share um, like the coding project as well? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, sometimes 
Um, we sort of choose based on skills. So if someone is better in robotics and someone is better in video, we kind of split up um, who does what. Or also if someone wants to learn a new thing, we're always eager to say, if you want to pick this up, why don't you try the robotics this time? Um, and I want to give a quick reminder to everyone tuning in, please put your questions for Danny and about all of his awesome work that he's doing with Meow Wolf um, into the Q&A. So Danny, where do you think your curiosity stemmed from? Wow, well, um, like I said, I've kind of always been into, um, well, taking things apart. When I was little, I had the tape recorders and tape players, and I don't know what got into me. I would just want to figure out how they worked. So I would kind of take them apart and then see that some of it was mechanical and some part was electrical. And uh, I would want to learn about the different parts. And I, I think that, you know, taking things apart, learning how things work, understanding how systems work um, is kind of a fun skill for, for anyone to develop. So tell us more about yourself. Like, what do you like to do outside of work? Oh, well, um, I live here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, it's very beautiful. So I like to go outdoors and hike and camp. Uh, I like to play guitar and garden. Um, but one hobby that I have that is sort of CS related is the hobby of amateur radio, also known um, as ham radio for weird historical reasons. And I'll show you a picture uh, about that. So um, when you're an amateur radio operator, what you do is uh, learn the science behind how radio works and build your own uh, radios and antennas and communicate with people all over the world or uh, off this world. What I'm gonna show here is a picture on the left of an antenna at my house that I built. And on the right is a picture I got from the International Space Station as it was going overhead. And uh, anyone, students uh, as young as junior high or high school could even get involved in amateur radio and imagine picking up pictures from the space stations or from weather satellites. Uh, and I have a lot of fun doing that here in town. That sounds super cool. So a question about in your professional journey, what were some of the titles that you had uh, with the work that you were doing? And then what are some of the salary ranges that someone could expect to make um, with those job titles? Well, my uh, journey went through a few different changes. In fact, I started um, in the arts field and worked in the music industry in a music recording studio for a long time before I became a roboticist, in fact. In those days, I was making probably thirty or forty thousand uh, dollars running a very small studio. Um, but during that time, I got so interested in the electronics of it, you know, guitarists and how their signal goes through their pedals or how the mixing board works. And I got into the electronics and went back to school. So that's what got me back into electrical engineering. Uh, on, on the Russian military. Folks wouldn't mind muting the mics. Um, uh, so then I went back to school for the electrical engineering part. I was in school for a while, and after that um, was when I started to get uh, jobs like a lecturer in, in, uh, in engineering. Those kinds of things also pay around forty dollars to $50,000. Um, and moving up, uh, I've worked as what's called a developer, a software developer, uh, where you just say work for people who need custom software made for them. Um, that that pay is often not per year, but it really depends on the job. So you can work on a job where you may get paid $100 for a small thing or $1,000 for a bigger thing, and it really depends. Um, so through the years, I've kind of had several different types of, of work and now I've landed where I am. And would you be able to tell us like what is a typical salary range for a creative engineer? Yeah, so creative engineers tend to make uh, over $75,000 at, at Meow Wolf. And, uh, and yeah, and, and, and they're sort of uh, the top end depends on how long you've been there and your experience. And like many other companies, uh, the more knowledge you have in your field and the more experience you have in your field, the, the better paid you are. And so um, for creative engineering, could you start off, do you need, first of all, a four-year degree? Do you need a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD? What is required to be a creative engineer? Well, I see the most important part of it is just being a very inquisitive person who loves to design things and make things, figure out how things work, and uh, you know, start picking up the tools to do it. Like there's a lot of free software out there um, and a lot of maker spaces and maker groups that you could sort of get involved with um, these days. And to be a creative engineer, I don't think there's, there really isn't a specific 
educational requirement. It's really about your experience and what you know. Um, sort of if you have the experience working in the, the stuff that makes Meow Wolf work, um, that, that's the kind of people that we like on our, on our creative engineering team. And in fact, I, I should mention our team is several people with lots of different skills. So I'm more of a roboticist and we have other people who specialize in lighting, other people who specialize in sound, other people who specialize in like the IT infrastructure even. So um, there's sort of room for all kinds of different interests uh, in creative engineering. And so when you come into this space, um, do you already need to be an expert with coding and computer science, or do you get to learn on the job? How do you gain more experience with computer science? Well, we don't expect that everyone knows everything right away. So um, there are some, some common things that a lot of folks in our field know. So there's a, a platform out there called Arduino that is great for making um, circuits and interactive elements. That's something we use a lot. So if if you know Arduino, that's that will help you sort of in the creative engineering field. Um, but um, like I said, we're not super specific and uh, I don't expect everyone to know robotics, but if you want to get on a project that makes you learn robotics, I'll be there to sort of mentor you. And that's another thing our team does for each other is, you know, help each other out with our expertise. So there is opportunity for mentorship once you land a job or start working in this field. Yeah, definitely. Since so much of the job is very unique, um, you know, there aren't a lot of places like Meow Wolf out there. The, the, the stuff that you know is pretty specific, and so it, it's pretty valuable to know that stuff. We cross over a lot into how buildings are made, too. So if you know a lot about the electrical systems or the heating systems in a building as a construction uh, or architect worker, um, that's also a great skill to have. Great, so we have a question from Barjan. Shout out from Hillsboro, Wisconsin. What type of process does Meow Wolf use to come up with their new exhibit? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, we're, uh, we like to do brainstorming where we kind of all get together and just come up with ideas. And um, maybe someone will have uh, a story idea that's really a start of an idea. Like, you know, someone's going on a journey to a place and then we kind of brainstorm as a big group. And uh, I've been part of brainstorming groups with several hundred people, if you can imagine that, all kind of dreaming up new stories and, and ways to tell a, a story in a place like now. We have another question. This comes from, hopefully pronouncing this correctly, Kayo Kio, regarding coding. What languages do you mostly use? Oh, so the top languages that are used in, on our creative engineering team are, um, uh, touch designer, which is a visual language, Max, which is a visual language as well. And what I mean by that is um, you code by making blocks and connecting them with lines and watching the data sort of flow between the code blocks. And it's a different way of coding than writing text, which is an, another very popular way of, of writing code in my group. We use uh, processing, which is a form of Java. We also use Python a lot as well. Great. Maureen Garda's class is asking, what is the most difficult part of your job? Oh, wow. Well, you know, um, there are two tricky parts. The first tricky part is um, figuring out how to take an artistic idea and make it happen technically, right? You have to sort of interpret almost like interpreting poetry and translating it to another language, or really you're translating it into math and code. That could be a very tricky part of a project. The second trickiest part is actually installing the thing in place. Some, we have to really run wires everywhere. And if you can imagine, say, inside your car, how many wires there are and how many buttons and lights and knobs, that's a lot of wiring. And I often end up completely inside a robot with just my boots sticking out as I'm running wiring. It sounds tedious, like it takes, it's, it can be time consuming sometimes. It, it really can, yeah. A lot of things can take time, but you know, with patience and with a good team, it's a lot of fun. So we have another question here from Tiara Bobula. What future technologies can you imagine fourth grade students will be using more of when they are in high school and college careers? Oh, that's a very great question. You know, I'm in robotics, so I can't help but imagine that we'll see more robots all over society uh, helping people out. And that's a great thing that folks who do now is start thinking of all the wacky robots that don't exist yet that could exist to help people out in the future. 
I can't wait to see uh, what we do with that. And I can't wait to see maybe robotic characters and stuff in Meow Wolf. That would be amazing. That's so creative, that video you showed us. It was a little creepy, but intriguing. <laughs> I'm very curious about this uh, you know, store now in uh, Las Vegas to check it out. So mm -hmm. we have another question for Maureen Garda again. So what does your daily schedule look like? Like what is a typical day for you? What are some of your tasks or duties? Well, so a, a typical day, um, maybe like today, um, I'll wake up and, you know, check my emails and catch up with all my teams and what's going on uh, in the company and with our projects. Um, and then I'll usually have a few meetings with people and that's where we sort of get together to either make a decision about something important or maybe bring up something important that we, we are not aware of. Um, and then I spend most of my day um, either writing code or uh, designing circuit boards and stuff like that to, uh, to make our exhibits work. So next up, I do wanna ask you some questions so that you can give our viewers, um, classrooms tuning in students, some advice. So looking back on all of your work and educational journey, what obstacles or challenges did you face and how did you approach or overcome them? Uh, see, that's, that's an interesting question because as I mentioned earlier, I had to transition sort of into the STEM field from the arts field at one point. So I was working in a music recording studio and I didn't know a lot about the technology, but when I went to school and started learning the technology, I found it very difficult. And I don't think that's surprising for a lot of people that sometimes the math and, and stuff is hard. And even today, I run into very hard technical problems all the time um, still. It's not like one day you, you just solve them. But what I did discover when I faced these problems was that I wasn't the only one. Um, you could always find other people who are as confused as you and form study groups, um, form teams, form um, communities. And next thing you know, you're, you're helping each other learn and you kind of all level up as, as a group. So what were there people who helped you along the way? Who were they and how did they help you? Oh yeah, uh, I had, a, I guess, a lot of help from, from my teachers along the way who supported me. Um, one in particular, when I was in high school, um, I had a physics teacher named Mr. Bertson who saw that I was interested in sculpting with weird materials while I was in art class. And he offered me his physics lab so that I could use his Bunsen burners to melt glass and make sculptures out of that kind of stuff. But he also taught me how to properly use lab equipment and also taught me the physics of what I was doing with the materials that I was playing with. And for me, it was so important to have someone who was interested in my creativity, but also interested in teaching me what I was doing so that I could make better projects later. Um, yeah. And was there someone specifically that helped you perhaps with the CS? You mentioned that um, there's challenges with the math and computer science aspects of that. Um, is there someone that stands out to you that helped you through those difficult times? Um, well, I had uh, professors who helped me out, but really it was it was my my teammates and my friends and and the the, the people in the classes with me who were just as as stumped as I was on some of these hard math problems. Uh, my my friends like Henry, my friends like Vladimir, who we would sit there and at the same computer, look at the same code, all three of us and go, what is this doing? And then at, at some point, one of us would get it and then all of us would get it. Yeah, that sounds, I can relate to that as well. Um, and so just a quick reminder, please add your questions to the Q&A as we're getting ready to wrap up. So um, if students are interested in pursuing similar career paths like the ones you've mentioned as a creative engineer, what are some steps that they can take? Well, um, you know, keep keep making things. Find find some tools that you could use to to learn to make things however you like. Whether it's um, writing poetry or playing guitar or uh, writing code, um, you know, uh, find a way to uh, to learn a skill and sort of get better at it and learn to express things. And if you could give one piece of advice to students who are listening. Um, it could be work related or not, what would it be? Oh, well, um, well, I guess I'll just um, jump off of that, that same answer I just gave that it, you should start, start building and start writing and start making the world that you want to live in. That's great advice. 
And so this is a question for Mr. A. How long does it take to work on a single project? Oh, well, it all depends. Some projects can be this big and those might take me like a day. Sometimes I have, and let's see if I could pull something up here. I have a project that maybe you could see. This is, might look like some of your experiments here, just wiring and sensors. I'm testing out a bunch of sensors to see how they work. A project like this might only take me a week because there's a lot of um, code out there that I could grab, test, and then um, see if things worked out. But a bigger project, like for example, that robot that I showed you earlier, might take a couple of months. Um, the longest project, I, the longest I've worked on a project is probably about a couple of months. And do you mean that comes from like the idea to the actual finished product? Yeah, that's usually from, from the time that we start drawing some drawings of what we think it should look like until it's really done. That, that can actually take even long. I, had, I guess I hadn't considered at the beginning the whole concept and how you come up with your idea. That can take a whole month just by itself if you have a very big concept. Like I know this, when we come up with our stories for our whole uh, building, that could take several months. And so really quick, Danny, what is the most fun, what's the funnest, most fun thing about your job? Oh man, working, working with a team of, of people that I really like to build something that, that we think is gonna inspire people um, to do this themselves. We, we want people to walk out of Meow Wolf thinking, um, I could do this too. Let's go out there and change the world to, to match what we want it to be like. Well, thank you, Danny, for joining us today and sharing your CS journeys. And thank you, teachers and students, for joining in. Please remember to check out other chats this spring, as well as past chats from the fall at co.org forward slash CS journeys. Also, teachers, please check your email for a survey. We value your feedback and want to know how to make these chats better for you and your students. So thank you so much, Danny. Thank you, Soraya, and thanks everybody out there. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.